Welcome to the History Unplugged podcast, the unscripted show that celebrates unsung heroes, myth busts historical lies, and rediscovers the forgotten stories that changed our world. I'm your host, Scott Rank. One of the worst Nazis in the Third Reich was General Hans Kammler. He was responsible for the construction of Hitler's slave labor sites in concentration camps. He personally oversaw a lot of the construction, and the death toll at Auschwitz and other places wouldn't have been nearly as high if he hadn't engineered them to such precision. He personally altered the design of Auschwitz to increase crowding, ensuring that epidemic diseases would complement the work of gas chambers. Hitler was so pleased by his work that he put him in charge of the Nazi rocket and nuclear weapons program. At the end of the war, he had more power than SS chief Heinrich Himmler. So why hasn't anyone heard of General Hans Kammler? In this episode, I'm speaking with Dean Reuter, author of the new book, The Hidden Nazi, The Untold Story of America's Deal with the Devil. He worked with collaborators Colm Lowry and Keith Chester, who've researched Kamler for decades. According to official counts, Kamler committed suicide at the very end of the war, and that's why he's not there at the Nuremberg trials. But he was at about the rank of General Patton, and it's not as though his body would have been left behind. So in this interview, we discuss how U.S. government documents prove Kamler was in U.S. custody for months after the war's end and his declared suicide, evidence of how far the Nazis had come in their nuclear research, and how the United States was largely unaware of this, and how the paper trail of Kamler goes cold about 10 months after the war is over, and Reuters' theories on what could have happened. Perhaps he could have been extradited to the United States in something similar to Operation Paperclip, sensational but unlikely. More likely, he stayed in Europe and was interrogated for months, but then dropped into a rat line and shipped off to South America and used as an intelligence asset against the Soviet Union, as were other former Nazi officials, or that he remained in Allied custody and was extradited. We don't really know what happened to him, but in this discussion, we get into a fascinating look at a forgotten chapter and a forgotten figure in World War II. So I hope you enjoyed this discussion with Dean Reuter. Dean, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Scott. It's a pleasure to be here. I I appreciate you uh, having me on. Well, I am very curious about this topic. And let's start in the beginning with how you came across it. How did you get started in the story about Kamler? And you note that you've been investigating this for a very long time. Where did it begin for you? Sure. I'm a lawyer in a uh, think tank, and I've done a couple law and policy books in the past. And a friend of mine from uh, who I know th- from college had uh, published a World War II book, and he approached me as a friend, as a lawyer, uh, to do a collaboration agreement between him and another researcher. Uh, in conducting his World War II research on the previous book, he came across this uh, particularly evil Nazi SS general Hans Kammler. Uh, And then he stumbled across another researcher, uh, a guy named Dr. Colm Lowry in Europe, who was researching the same general. So he approached me uh, to do an agreement, a legal agreement, so that those two could share the fruits of their research without stabbing each other in the back. And uh, you know, I did that in a straightforward way, and then he started mentioning some details as to this General Kamler, who he described as an all-powerful, uh, particularly evil Nazi general uh, who was uh, – first of all, he helped make the Holocaust possible, um, and he was an integral part of Germany's notorious slave labor trade. But by the end of the war, he ruled all of Germany's secret weapons, including – Uh, the infamous German vengeance weapons, the German V-1 and V-2 rockets, uh, but also a rocket designed to reach the eastern seaboard of the United States from Europe, which many people haven't heard about, Uh, but also, you know, Germany's jet aircrafts, its special munitions, and even its nuclear weaponry. So um, he he was just all-powerful. He was also as evil as he was powerful, uh, but nobody had written about Kamler. And I, of course, was being an attorney, I was skeptical, um, incredulous even. Uh, it didn't seem to me there could be a uh, a Nazi um, who had risen to such heights of power, uh, who was as bad as he was, uh, who had never been written about in history. Uh, that was the claim of these uh, of, of Colm Lowry, uh, Dr. Lowry, and uh, and Keith Chester, who ultimately became my co-authors. Although I wrote the book, they were the main researchers on this. Uh, So I I entered the project with a a healthy dose dose of skepticism, um, but in the end became the primary 
author because they convinced me that uh, everything they said was true. Well, that is the big question. What, um, what did Kamler do during the war and why isn't he as known as well as other figures like Himmler? Sure. First of all, as to why he's not well known, he reportedly committed suicide at the end of the war. So there was no need to go and find him. Nobody chased him or his records. In the fall of 1948, three years after the war, the end of the war, a German court in uh, Charlottenburg, Berlin, even ruled him dead. There was an official adjudication of his death, retroactive to May 1945, the end of the war. So uh, in putting together this book, we reached out to the U.S. Department of Justice, Office of Special Investigations, which your audience probably knows is the, the famous U.S. Nazi uh, uh, hunters uh, for the United States. We reached out to the Wiesenthal Center. Uh, we even reached out to the Mossad uh, and confirmed that none of them had ever hunted for Kamler. They, uh, their general response was, paraphrasing here, was we have limited resources. We had to pursue the living war criminals. So not only history, but the best Nazi hunters in the world had no interest in Kamler. Everyone believed the suicide um, until um, my good friends, now good friends, Keith Chester and Cole Mallory picked up the scent and, and took it from there. Uh, so that's, that's the explanation as to why he was never pursued. He committed suicide, quote unquote, and uh, all the Nazi hunters, official and unofficial, turned to other targets, folks who were alive. That was the priority, of course. And I really want to get into how he escaped because you have the rat lines of South America on one hand, you have Operation Paperclip on the other hand for Werner von Braun and with the early formation of NASA. But before we get into all that, I want to circle back to Kamler's career. And you had mentioned some of the different things that he had done of architecting the design of Auschwitz and others. What are other salient points of his career that you think are important to emphasize as we get into his disappearance and suspected collaboration with the United States later? Sure. Well, let me start in the beginning with, with Kamler. He was born in 1901 in what is now Poland uh, before the First World War. His father uh, was an anti-communist, and he was raised as an anti-communist, uh, like other Germans of that era. Uh, Kamler's father and and Kamler himself were baffled by Germany's uh, sudden capitulation capitulation and and loss in World War One. It was, um, I'm sure you know, an inexplicable and stunning, embarrassing loss from the Germans' perspective. Um, so that helped form Kamler. Uh, I, I I became convinced. I mean, we started at the beginning, looked at his childhood. Um, uh, but World War One was not his war, but it helped form him. Uh, he, he ended up uh, at the end of uh, World War One joining the cavalry, joining the eastern border defense. Uh, such as it was, uh, it uh, operated for a couple years, uh, but he was always born to be a, a professional man. And he went to school. Uh, he graduated, uh, he got his undergraduate degree from a university in Gdansk in, in architecture and engineering. He went on to get a PhD from the Technical University in Hanover, Germany. Um, so he was always a professional guy, not a blue collar worker. He was a leader, not a follower. Um, he was really the designer of the machinery, not a mere cog uh, within it. So um, between the wars, uh, he was among the first to join the Nazi party, uh, even before Hitler became chancellor of Germany. Uh, then he joined the dreaded SS, uh, the Schutzstaffel, uh, Hitler's personal militarized protection squad, even before Hitler became president of Germany. And, and that's important. Uh, as I learned, there's a big distinction between uh, folks who served uh, in the German military, the soldiers and sailors, uh, and members of the Nazi party, so who were the true ideologues, not really just soldiers and sailors. Um, and then there were the true hardliners within the Nazi party, the members of the SS. Those were truly the worst of the worst. Uh, there's really no dispute about that. Um, and Kamler would rise to the top ranks of the SS achieving its highest commissioned rank uh, within that central circle. So he was really the worst of the worst of the worst, if you will, uh, just a, a really uh, bad actor. And if, if, if he was known to have sub survived the war, I'm convinced he would have topped the list of wanted war criminals. He would have been more sought after than Klaus Barbie, uh, the Butcher of Lyon, more wanted than Dr. Mengele, the Angel of Death, uh, perhaps even more significant uh, than Adolf Eichmann, who was head of the Gestapo, uh, whom he, he, out, he ended up outranking. Um, so 
uh, his his military career, his professional career, began sort of in a benign way. Frankly, he uh, during the earliest years of the war, uh, he was involved in civil engineering projects, building roads, uh, buildings, irrigation and drainage systems, communication networks, all the sort of civil uh, uh, apparatus of of any company of any country rather. Um, these were complicated construction projects. He cut his teeth on these, um, and in the end, he ended up being in charge of them from the beginning to the end uh, of those projects in all aspects of them, which became sort of his M.O. He would uh, assume a role in a project and gradually spread his wings, spread his influence, and end up in charge of them. Um, it was an extraordinary sort of tact that I think he learned from from Himmler, frankly. Himmler was fond of giving uh, SS status uh, to, to key people in the Nazi regime uh, and then have them report up to him. Uh, so, um, But Kammler, Kammler d- began sort of benignly, uh, but then during this time, Germany, this is when Germany's expanding the Third Reich uh, diplomatically and militarily. We have the, the Anschluss uh, and the... And the you know, then they take over Czechoslovakia through Sudetenland and the invasion of Poland and France and the, the lower countries. And uh, soon enough, they're in charge of most of continental Europe. Um, and, and, and Kamler during this period just began to ascend. Uh, he served in the German labor ministry, ministry, again, doing a lot of construction stuff. But now with a lot of connection to German industry and the sort of elite in the German private sector, um, and then he switched to the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force. Um, and this is, uh, I found, very significant because Kamler already had a lot of credibility as an early uh, member of the Nazi Party and as an early member of the SS. But he got even more credibility uh, by switching to the Luftwaffe. Adolf Hitler, uh, I'm sure your audience knows this, never really trusted the German army, the Wehrmacht. Um, that was the same German army that was blamed for Germany's loss in World War I. Uh, the German army, of course, predated Hitler's rise to power, so it belonged to Germany, not to Hitler. The Luftwaffe, in contrast, was created by Hitler. It owed its allegiance to Hitler. Uh, so Kamler was now um, sort of in a catbird seat, if you will. He was part of three different organizations that essentially owed their existence to Hitler. Um, and, and that more importantly than that, enjoyed the confidence of Hitler. He was in the Luftwaffe, the Nazi Party, and the SS. And those credentials combined to make uh, Kamler unassailable. That's really how he, he um, grew in power. Um, and then he used that power and his connections uh, to further the Holocaust, to really to help make the Holocaust possible um, before he assumed his final position as uh, ruler of Germany's uh, secret weapons, uh, all of Germany's secret weapons. And I'd be happy to discuss uh, the Holocaust if you want to – his role in the Holocaust, that is, if you want to get into that. Yeah, let's do that because you mentioned some things that – I was surprised by about Germany's secret weapons and I thought was counterintuitive. But let's go over his role in the Holocaust first. Sure. His first notable project uh, in the Holocaust during the war for our purposes was the expansion of Germany's concentration camps, making them larger and larger in order to house uh, more prisoners. Uh, This started in um, November, uh, uh, September really of 1941. So just after uh, the German invasion of Russia uh, through Operation Barbarossa. We see Kamler visiting Auschwitz and other camps and planning for their expansion. Um, I, I think uh, Kamler might have had the Holocaust in mind at this point, but uh, certainly um, had in mind the idea of making the camps bigger to absorb Russian POWs. Um, They didn't really come in great numbers. That is, the Russian POWs didn't really uh, come in great numbers. Um, And these camps quickly became um, killing camps, uh, those designed to exterminate uh, the Jewish race and slave labor camps, designed to imprison hundreds of thousands of the most fit prisoners to further Germany's war economy. Um, And uh, Kamler did this not only at Auschwitz, but um, which is, of course, the most infamous of all the camps, but at dozens of other camps as well. Um, I, I know that the, the Holocaust involved complicity by tens of thousands of people. Um, 
But I, I would say that Kamler's role was central. He's described repeatedly by others in the, in the 